I'm here today with our good friend, Willard Ashley. Willard has a new book that was just released called New Rules for Radicals, Techniques and Tactics for Faith-Based Leaders. Willard is the Vice President of Community Relations and Director of the Center for Clergy Care. He's the founder and senior pastor of the Abundant Joy Community Church in Jersey City, New Jersey. He's the Vice Chair of the Bergen County Human Relations Commission and is the co-chair of the Interfaith Anti-Racism Co Coalition in the greater New York City metropolitan area under the umbrella of the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. Willard is a New Jersey State certified and nationally certified psychoanalyst and has previously published numerous books on various topics. He teaches several graduate and certificate courses and was very instrumental in helping to establish the very first Publishing in Color Conference in 2018 at the New Brunswick Theological Seminary. So Willard, it's so wonderful to reconnect here uh, about your book, and it's always a pleasure to uh, collaborate with you. It's great. It's great to see you, and I'm grateful and appreciative for this opportunity to be in conversation and to reconnect with an old friend. <laughs> well, absolutely. And um, you know, you've just, I mean, quite frankly, got such an amazing background. I just kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, can you tell people a little bit more about some of those things that I mentioned? Well, ba basically, I, I have three professional identities. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm professor being one, and I literally just retired from full-time academia. So I'm no longer the vice president. I cur Currently, I teach at Rutgers University School of Social Work in their Doctor of Social Work program. I'm also teaching at the New Jersey Institute for the Training in Psychoanalysis. So I'm still teaching, you know, as many courses, but just in, in, in different places for a lot less money. So <laughs> a lot less money. Um, and and so I had the professor hat that I wear proudly. I still am a past congregational pastor. And I looked at how time flies. It's been 39 years. Wow. Yeah. Next, next year starts in the 40th years as a pastor in four different congregations, uh, New Hampshire and then three in New Jersey. So that, and then my more, more focus as of late has been as a psychoanalyst. And so I literally just opened up a brand new office as part of my transition from full-time academia in, into psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, marriage and family counseling. And that, that, you know, good news, bad news, it's going well, which means a lot of people are, you know, trusting me to have, walk with them in their journey. But there's a lot of need. There's a great amount of need, even more so given the pandemic and all, all that goes with it. Well, you know, so good to hear all that because, you know, I've always viewed you as an entrepreneur and now you kind of are unleashed. You know, you're exactly. a free agent, right? You know, exactly. <laughs> wherever the calls and it feels you. And it feels wonderful. Just <laughs> I, mean, I feel the same way since I started off on my own. I mean, it's just, oh my goodness, you know, the landscape of opportunity for- Well, it's funny. Someone said, you know, are you going to take a long vacation? I can take as much vacation as I want. I just don't get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, really. And, you know, I find, you know, in theory, I could retire. I could go on vacation full time, right? But because right. so, I'm doing all these other things, you know, I don't have time for vacation. <laughs> it, exact, exactly. We're on, this, we're on the same page. <laughs> so I have to balance that, you know, because it's like, you know, my wife would like me to take more time, I think, you know, <laughs> anyway. So um, before we get into the new book, <clears throat> could you tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the previous books you've published? So the, the first book was Disaster Spiritual Care. And it came, it was, it's on Skylight Paths. And it came out, came about because I was looking for a cheat sheet because I was supposed to give a lecture. And I, I was very much involved in 9-11 and Katrina and in recovery efforts from both of those disasters. And I was asked to give a lecture. Someone said, oh, I need a real quick cheat sheet. And someone says, well, you didn't write it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I have an ego, but stop. You know, no, 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 really, you didn't write it. And I realized like, holy cow, it wasn't written. And so I united with my good friend, Rabbi Stephen Roberts and said, we have to write the cheat sheet. And he goes, I'm game. So we wrote the quote unquote cheat sheet for dealing with spiritual care following a disaster we have 30 plus contributors and that in and of itself was some oh no we that'll never sell too many contributors well guess what it's now in its second edition second edition expanded and it's doing quite quite well excellent so to have that book then there was i guess i call my tenure book which was learning to lead 
and again we have about 30 I have about 30 contributors and I was just trying to look at how do you provide leadership as a Christian for the most part although we also have Jewish contributors as well and what are the kind of the tools that you need to provide effective leadership in the 21st century so those are kind of the two that I'm you know got me started and, and launched me I was a contributor for a number of other books and I'm happy about about those as well but the ones that had my name on the front those those, <laughs> those, those were the two <laughs> well, those are great books and you know um, I think as you said, anthologies like that are the collection of essays oftentimes don't sell as well. The publishers don't like them, but you know, I think they're really important books to hear from a variety of voices like that. And, and these are people that are doing it. They're practitioners. They're also academics in some cases, but they're doing both. And they're saying, here's the real live lived experience. This, this is what's going on. Boots on the ground. Here's what's happening. Not and just yes, theory. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. Which I think is great. So Absolutely. it's more practical, it's more useful yeah. for people who want to learn, you know, from people that are already doing it. So kudos for that. So again, the new book, New Rules for Radicals. How did that come about? Well, it's a miracle. And I, and I say that <laughs> proudly. It's, it's, it's a miracle. Um, a colleague of mine had introduced me to a publisher and I had a book contract to write, to write, to write this book. And in the midst of that, I ended up having five eye surgeries. And being responsible, I'm going to try to write this book anyway. Can't half see, <laughs> you know, but I'm going to try to write this book. And at some point, some voice, whether it was my ophthalmologist, surgeon, my family, some voice said, no, no, let your eyes heal. No, you can't, you can't do this. And the publisher canceled the contract. So, you know, a deal's a deal and, you know, you missed the deadline and, oh, well, you know, I'm sorry you went through this, but oh, well. And so I was feeling really bad about it. I mentioned it to my, my, my colleagues at Andover Newton Seminary, Theological Seminary. And they looked at me like, Will, you have this wide, vast network. Hold, hold, lift your head up, dude. Make some <laughs> phone calls. In fact, don't even make phone calls. Look next door to the people that you work with. Hello. And so, lo and behold... Someone that's at Judson Press is on the board. And I sat during coffee and said, you know, here's what's happened. Here's my proposal that was approved by this other, the other publishing company. And long story short, within two weeks of the one contract being canceled, I had a new contract with Judson Press. Wow. That's and, so You wild. know, we have fast, we fast forwarded this through the process because we really like what you're trying to say. So normally it would take forever to go through process, but we put this on a fast track. So let's go. That is so excellent. I mean, you know, how lemons turn into lemonade, right? I mean, I, I, and, and not to put down the other publishing house, but I feel and have felt much more freedom hmm. Hmm. with Judson. Okay. And so that was a learning for me that different publishers have different expectations and different spin. And, and I get that part. But I guess this felt more more that this book is Willard as opposed to somebody editing to death that, you know, fits this audience versus this audience, but it's not your own voice. So what I like about this is this is my voice. Good or bad, go, it's my voice. <laughs> you go back to the beginning when you very first, you know, came up with the concept for this book. What what motivated you to do that? I've been deeply involved in community organizing uh, really all of my life but more targeted as, as a clergy person in Jersey City. And we have been in this 30 plus year struggle to build affordable housing in Hudson County, Jersey City. And so the book really talks about what it takes to be in a long term fight, if you will. And how do you sustain yourself during that? How do you keep the issue on the front burner and at the same time, not burn out. And as new people come and go, how do you get them to be interested in this topic and to buy into it, so to speak? So that's kind of one of the main the main thrusts. The other the other reason for for the book was being an academic and going around and, and teaching. I recognize that there's this new wave of organizers, want to do good type folks, who don't really have the basic skills of how to organize. Mm -hmm. 
They can mobilize. And I think there's a difference. So they can say, you know what? This happened. We need to bring a thousand people to say we don't like it. Great. But to then to organize so that you take the energy of, of that mass rally and turn it into a seat at the table to negotiate how do you change systems and policies and laws, I realized they were missing that piece. Wow. That's that's really cool to be able to tie those two things together. Yeah. Right. Because it moves it from being a one shot deal you know, exactly. to something that's got not only longer term um, impact, but but greater impact in more areas than just on the street. And that would be the that would be my my agitation to, to the younger folks and maybe some not so young to say, OK, so you had the rally, you made the front page of newspaper. What changed? Yeah. What next? What do you follow it up to make something actually change? Right. Right. <laughs> well, that's excellent. I mean, I can really see why a lot of people can use this. I didn't realize that that was the focus of the book. Yeah. It, it's about how do you how do you change policies, systems? Uh, how do you change the, the laws and live to tell about it? <laughs> <laughs> really? There you go. So um, in the book, you give an overview of a pioneer, Saul Alinsky, and his work. What? Now that was fifty years ago, right? Roughly. Yeah. So what? You know what's changed or what's uh, to learn from? And that? that was the other reason. That was another reason for 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 writing this particular book, is lots of change in fifty years, and nothing has changed in fifty yeah, years. Yeah, exactly. Um, Saul Alinsky social worker, University of Chicago grad, et cetera, et cetera, Chicago. But he wasn't a congregational leader. And I make a distinction and devote a good portion of the book that is a difference as as social worker versus when you're the rabbi, the imam, the pastor, the priest, and see the same people every week, and you're accountable to those people. And that came about from some of the mass protests in Ferguson and other places where my colleagues were saying, you know, the first time I was arrested symbolically, yay, go pastor, go rabbi, there, you know. The second time was like, mm. <laughs> and by the third time, like, you know, you're embarrassing us now, you know, come back and do your real job, you know, do the worship <laughs> over the weekend, go visit people that are sick, run, you know, run the administrative stuff. And they were frustrated. Because they were saying, wait a minute, we learned in seminary how important social justice can be and should be, and it's biblical. We're trying to do social justice, and we're not getting the applause and the appreciation and affirmation from the congregation. What the heck? <laughs> and so the book tries to say, well, you we have to do some homework first, and you have to exegete your congregation. And yes, I know it's on the brochure and on the website, but to really dig and find out, are they really about social justice? The way that they advertise when you said, yes, I'm going to come. Mm -hmm. And so the book talks about ways to, to kind of look at that and, re and really do interrogation to find out if that's the case. Because you really do need your congregation behind you. Because you're right. When you get and symbolically arrested, you know, your name is in the press, in the media, in negative light. You need to be able to say, my congregation is behind me. And one of the ways to dilute your power is remove you from your congregation. So to talk about how do you how do you keep both happy and to be realistic. In many congregations, you've got red states, blue states, and purple states all in the same pew. Yeah, yeah. And so how do you maintain a sense of integrity around social justice, realizing that some folks won't like the sermon this week? <laughs> <laughs> really? So what would you say would be like the number one thing that you'd like people to take away from the book? That you can win. Mm. That, you know, the proverbial, you can't beat City Hall. Well, you don't have to beat City Hall, but you can have a conversation and negotiate with City Hall to have the outcome or the outcomes you would like for your particular self-interest. And like I say in the book, I'm not pushing any, any particular spin other than saying that these are the tools that will allow you to take the things of interest to you and to fight for those issues. And that one of the challenges is that politicians listen, but not to the voices of ordinary people. 
the developers, the bankers, the folks that wrote the check to get you elected, the special interest groups, the lobbyists. So how do ordinary citizens get their voice heard? And not just heard, but then people, you know, people that make decisions react and respond to hearing your voice and the things that are important to you. So that that's that, you know, it, it's 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 that 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 kind of insulting thing to punch. You know, you shouldn't be involved in politics. Okay, I will remember that next time you want to come to my church when we, during election time. You want me to do rah rah rah? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow, how powerful! What a what a useful, you know, set of tools and, and you know, a very practical thing for you to have done to write this. So. Um, what about looking forward? I mean, are there any other you know book projects that you can? Talk well, it's interesting. About one, yeah, well, one of my one of my colleagues suggested that I take the outline of this book and begin to think of how would it apply in the psychoanalytic world. Really, really. So I'm thinking like, okay, so they're willing to help me with this. There's a well-known institution up in in Cambridge that said, you know, we said we help you give some thought some thought to to this. Excellent. So I'm thinking, okay, and the more I'm looking at it, there, there are some parallels. I mean, it would take some work to kind of make, not to force fit it. And it does make sense. I'm becoming warmer and warmer to the idea. I just literally wrote a journal article for um, a psychoanalytic journal and talking about how do, you in, how do you address issues of race and racism in private practice and individual treatment. Interesting. Interesting. And so this, there, there, there is some, some, some parallel, not, not a lot of work to be done to, to get there. So. Cool. So, um, where can people learn more about all of your work and where can people learn more about the book? They can go on Judson Press website for this particular book. The book is also available on the normal channels, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, Walmart, and Excellent. the other books that I've written, they're are edited, they're on, on those as well. Good, good, good. Well, Willard, you know, congratulations on, you know, yet another element of all of your fine work. And, you know, thanks so much for doing something again that's so practical. Thank you. And that's been, that's, I was raised with the notion of you can get your PhD, you can get your terminal degree, whatever, but everyone doesn't have a PhD. Everybody doesn't have a terminal degree. Uh, you have to make it so that everyone's not a giraffe. <laughs> that, that, was, that was the way it was told to me. So you have to bring it down so everybody can have can drink from the same fountain. Well, it's just, you know, like you said, to make things happen outside of an academic, you know, sphere, um, it's important to make it practical. And it's not, and this is this is not anti-academia. It's not anti-intellectual. So I'm not, you know, there's there's 80 footnotes in the book. So I, do, <laughs> so I do document things. However, however, you know, people need to under, appreciate how do you get this done. Sure. Like you said earlier, you know, this is not just theory. I li I've lived this. I've lived this from a teenager up until now. So it's not just you know I took a couple of courses and know how to do this. I, I I've lived it. I teach it. It's still very much a part of my life. One of the illustrations in the book is as a teenager in my neighborhood, how we closed down a quote unquote discotheque that was drawing people that we didn't want around in our neighborhood because they were bringing guns and drugs and they were robbing us, et cetera. And like, oh, no, 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 no. And so, again, you know, it may not be taking on City Hall, but whatever those, whatever the cause or interest that has your attention, how do you address it? How do you how do you win, quote unquote? Very cool. Very cool. Well, congratulations, Willard, on this. Thank you. And um, you know, please let's stay in touch, you know, because Absolutely. I know there'll be lots of very interesting things to come. Sounds good.